Really appreciate the opportunity to be part of this event. You know, I was thinking of the way in as I was driving to Washington, D.C., where most of us know isn't the safest city in the country, that despite the fact that we've had a tremendous decrease in violent crime in the last 25 years, our country can still be a very dangerous place. Now, I was reviewing some statistics from the FBI that I want to share with you at the outset. Listen to these numbers. According to the Federal Bureau of Investigation, in a typical week in the United States of America, 300 Americans are murdered, 7,800 of us are robbed, 15,000 of our very own neighbors will be violently assaulted, 1,700 of our women, our mothers, our daughters, our sisters will be sexually assaulted or raped. In fact, I know you heard some of the harrowing tales from some of these victims earlier today. Now, despite the fact that our right to self-defense has been recognized for centuries, we've had courts in our own country that have ruled the police have no duty to provide individual security. In short, it is we and we alone that are very often responsible for our own self-defense. I think it was said very well by the representative just a moment ago that crime isn't limited by school boundaries, and neither should our right to self-defense. Because the reality in society today is very often the only thing that can stop a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. And believe me, they do it, and they do it every single day in the United States. Guns are used by law-abiding citizens over a million times every year for self-defense. Three to five times more often than they're ever used to commit a crime. Now, I don't think we would be in this position to have this great conference to talk about the future of passing campus carry if it wasn't for the NRA's work and perseverance over the last two plus decades to pass right to carry laws in 42 states. I think really the birth of this movement could be seen about 25 years ago with the passage of the first right to carry law. Wisconsin, luckily, just joined our ranks a few short weeks ago. We now have every state in the country, less the state of Illinois, that has some type of provision for armed self-defense. So for those of you, from Illinois, those of you watching in Illinois, it's time to get with the program and join the other 49 states. Yeah. Yeah. Now, the National Rifle Association is going to continue its work to further pass and enhance right to carry laws because we believe that any time we can expand the universe of law-abiding citizens to choose for themselves whether or not to carry a firearm. And whenever we can expand the universe of places they can legally arm themselves for self-defense, all Americans are safer. In fact, in 2011 alone, I'm very pleased to report that the National Rifle Association passed or enhanced right to carry laws or self-defense laws in 20 different states. 20 different states this year. Now, I remember being involved in some of these debates over right to carry. And in every state we tried to implement these laws, two things usually happened. First and foremost, our opponents came up with gloom and doom scenarios of what would happen if we trusted everyday law-abiding Americans with the choice to carry a firearm for self-defense. In fact, Florida, one of the first states to pass right to carry, our opponents claimed, we're gonna transform the sunshine state into the gunshine state. Well, that's the first thing that happens, predictions of gloom and doom by our opponents. The second thing that happens is we prevail, the law is passed, lives are saved, and our opponents are proven wrong. Just look at Florida, for example, a state that has issued more than one million permits to its law-abiding residents, yet had to revoke less than one hundredth of a percent of those permits for firearm-related crimes. So now the debate shift fast forward to try and extend this right to self-defense to qualified citizens on campuses across the country. And I think we stand on the shoulders of those 42 states that have right to carry to try to make the case to the American people a case that will resonate with them that our right to self-defense doesn't end when we cross an invisible boundary to go to school. We have worked, we will continue to work to pass campus carry in states across the country because it's the right thing to do. Our opponents far too often will ignore the fact that although campuses are still some of the safest places American students can be, they are not immune to crime, and that armed citizens have in fact stopped crimes on campuses. I'm sure Professor Lott cited a few of them, whether it was in 2002 at Appalachian Law School, or whether it was Pearl, Mississippi in, 2000, excuse me, in 1997, when we had armed citizens come to the rescue to save their fellow citizens on campus. 
Now you contrast the NRA and our support for giving citizens the choice to defend themselves in public, on the streets, on campus, with the philosophy of our opponents. Their security strategy amounts to the following. Flee, run and hide, play dead, and then and only then, if you're absolutely sure you're gonna get shot, maybe resist. Well, that's not a recipe for self-defense. That's a recipe for pray and hope. And that's not what we deserve today in the United States. Certainly not what those citizens who go to school on our nation's campuses deserve in the United States. You know, we had a situation not too long ago where two young brave students were able to disarm a shooter in Springfield, Oregon, because they rejected our opponent's philosophy of flee and hide and cower. But our opponents reject the notion, giving even the benefit of doubt that somehow, somewhere, somebody who's qualified to carry a firearm across the street at McDonald's when they're getting a cup of coffee or at a newsstand across the street, they ignore the fact that these people just may somehow save a life on college campus. Now, I personally have two young children who hopefully someday will go to school. And I have two wishes for them. First and foremost, like any other parent in America, I hope they're never in a classroom where an armed shooter comes in and tries to wreak mayhem. That's my first wish. But my second wish is if, God forbid, that happens, I hope and pray they or somebody in that classroom can give them a fighting chance and hopefully stand up and save their life. Those are my two hopes, and NRA is going to try to make those hopes a reality along with your help. You know, I predict as our efforts to pass campus carry spread across the nation, we are going to see the same foolish logic by our opponents we saw when they imposed right to carry. First, they will predict situations of gloom and doom. Then we will work together to pass that legislation, and we will prove them wrong when we see that not only has the mayhem not occurred, but our campuses have become safer because we've empowered people to make that choice for themselves, to stand up and hopefully protect themselves or their loved ones or a fellow student, if God forbid they are put in that situation. And as was just mentioned by our legislators, this is not an easy path. There is political risk, but doing the right thing often does involve political risk. And we commend those lawmakers who stand up and do something, not because it's easy, but because they know it's right and they know it will help save lives. But we need to help address the myths that our opponents perpetuate every time we push one of these pieces of legislation and distinguish between what we're really talking about and what we're not talking about. In most states, not every state, but in most states, to get a permit to carry a concealed firearm, one must be 21 years of age, pass a criminal background check, and pass a firearm safety course. And these are the type of people that we are empowering through choice to extend their right to self-defense across that natural and visible boundary onto campuses nationwide. So that citizens and students can be afforded the same level of protection while they're in class as they do when they're across the street. This fight is not going to be easy. It is going to take a concerted effort between NRA, other pro-Second Amendment groups, students for concealed carry on campus. How we win this fight is the same way we win every fight. That is continuous activism at every level. We need students and non-students alike who believe in self-defense and the right to choose to get a permit to carry self-defense, to contact your legislators, to let them know your position when these bills are pending before a legislative body or committee. We need you to change the makeup of legislatures where need be to replace those opponents of our self-defense with people who share our commitment to freedom and share our passion for being able to defend ourselves and our families. That means registering to vote at your first election, registering to vote. That means working on the campaigns of pro-Second Amendment candidates across the country to ensure that each successive legislative cycle and election cycle, we have more supporters of the Second Amendment and right to carry both on and off campus. NRA is taking lead on student activism through a program we've worked with very closely with students for concealed carry and we will continue to work on called NRA University. We've traveled to dozens of college campuses across the nation to talk about the myths surrounding gun control as a way to reduce crime control, to talk about the Second Amendment, what it truly means, to talk about what students can do to become better citizen activists both on and off campus. I ask you to consider hosting an NRA university at your campus 
and spreading the word to your fellow students who may not be here with us in Washington, D.C., so that we can get our mutual message out to more of the next generations of leaders to make sure that each successive state that pushes campus carry or seeks to expand castle doctrine or make right to carry simpler for law-abiding citizens has a chance to succeed because we are training a new volunteer of grassroots activists who are willing to speak up and get involved. I know you've been here a long day, so let me just conclude by offering the following comments. None that will surprise anybody in this audience. We all know that most criminals aren't stupid. They prefer their victims unarmed. I don't think it's any coincidence that some of these higher profile shootings that we see on the news happen at these so-called gun-free school zones, whether it's a church, whether it's a campus, whether it's a university setting. We've seen what happens with the experiment that most states currently live on, under, excuse me. We've seen what happens when the only person who's carrying a gun on campus is a deranged madman, a deranged criminal. Isn't it time to try something different? Isn't it time to try something that's worked in 42 states and to respect the rights of citizens who are duly licensed to carry a firearm virtually everywhere else in their state to give students and faculty members a fighting chance on campus? I'm going to end where I began, and I think it's a point that if you remember nothing else what I said today, we need to keep in mind that crime is not deterred by invisible school boundaries, and it's far past time that neither should our right to self-defense be. Please keep fighting, and thank you so much for inviting me here today.